morning once again. Are we on? Am I on there? Check, check, check. Let's open our Bibles, please, this morning to Psalm 23 once again. As we continue our verse-by-verse verse study. <clears throat> Psalm 23. This morning we're going to be honing in on the last part of verse 5 where it says, My cup runneth over. Let's go ahead and read the whole psalm then, again, and uh, then we'll pray. A psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this wonderful, wonderful psalm once again, Father. I pray that as we come to feast once again at your table, Lord, you would help us to understand that you would anoint us afresh with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and soften our hearts, Lord, to receive your word and to be changed by your word this morning, Lord. Fill us all afresh, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning, once again, we're coming in on the last part of verse 5. My cup runneth over. You know, a lot of times when you're getting a drink at a restaurant or somewhere else, the last thing you want is your cup to be runneth over. As the waitresses or waiter is giving you coffee or different things, but you see, as Christians, with the Good Shepherd, our cups should be continually running over. And as we come once again to uh, this portion of the Scripture, I'm going to rely heavily upon, again, the pastor who used to be a shepherd and later went on to be a pastor. And he wrote a commentary, and his insights are, are very priceless to me uh, in this study. It's been wonderful, wonderful time. Now, it's interesting, though, because as we come and, and we read this portion, my cup runneth over, to pr put it back in the context of a shepherd and the sheep, there'd be the time at night uh, that they would have a pen, if you will, that had four sides and a door. The door was, it was not really a door, it was just a doorway. It was empty. The, the, the shepherd would actually bring all the sheep into this pen, and, and as they would come by, he would put his staff out, uh, vertically, and, and the sheep would pass by under his staff, and they'd stop, and he would look them over for the night, check and see if they have any wounds that needed to be tended, as we talked about, to be anointed with oil, or, you know, if they had any bites or any bugs on them, anything like that. But they would also then, he would take out a cup that he had. He, he would have a special cup and, you know, as he, they would usually have their water in skins and, and they would put the water into this cup from the animal skin and then he'd give some water to each sheep as they were bedding down for the night. And, it, what, it, what, and again, it takes this whole scripture and puts it in a different light. That, that this is something that the shepherd would give to the sheep in a personal way. And we could see, though, perhaps, uh, you know, at times during the summer when the heat was getting intense, that, you know, maybe even this water would be sparse. There w they would have to ration it out. So instead of a full cup, maybe they received a half a cup or maybe even a quarter cup. Whatever rations they had to do to make sure that all the sheep at least got some water for their system. 
I'm going to date myself now. I remember when I was 16 and I first started driving back in the 1970s. And uh, some of you may remember uh, there was gas rationing going on in the country when I first, very first started driving. And I remember I, I, first I waited in this long line. I get to the front of the line, get to the gas station. It took me about 45 minutes. And all of a sudden the gas station attendant said, sorry, you can't get gas today. I'm like, well, why can't I? I waited in line. It's because you're not, you don't have the right license plate number. It had to end or start with a certain thing on a certain day. And so I had to wait till the next day. And I mean, I was on empty. I'm on fumes. And, and so, you know, we came back the next day, but they were rationing gas. There wasn't very much at the time. And, and again, that's what we see when we hear about a cup and, and we see that my cup runneth over. You know, there are times when the cup would runneth over when there's plenty and other times when there'd be rationing. And so, you know, again, this picture is easily transfers the, to the human history with, you know, in the last 6,000 years when there's been times needed to ration out supplies, to ration things out. Now, to be honest, especially our younger people here today and me for the most part in my life, a lot of us don't have any clue what rationing really means. Again, to me, rationing was when my mom would buy Count Chocula and we, I had two brothers and a sister. My sister didn't care about it, but us boys, we'd be rationing it out. We'd be counting almost every piece of cereal. Who got more? Or when it came to the cake, you know, who was cutting the cake? Who got the ration of the bigger? Who, hey, that's, he got more than I got. But we didn't have to really worry about rations when I was a kid. We didn't have to worry. Even today in America here, we don't have rationing. And I remember Talia's grandma, when she was alive, she lived through the Great Depression. And I remember we would go over her house, and when I was first starting to get to know her, and there'd be little sugar packets all over the house, little ketchup packets from McDonald's, and, and she would stack up every time she went to a restaurant. A coffee shop. My mom told me my grandma did the same thing. They didn't need it, didn't, but they had gone through such hard times during the Great Depression where everything was rationed that now that it's there, they took it again just in case they needed it, in case rationing came back. And you see, she had been so traumatized by her childhood that later in life she was still living in fear that it would happen again. And she kind of almost lived her whole life, even though she kind of turned into a hoarder a little bit. She was also just, it was almost with the heart of, hey, if we ever need it, if there's ever rationing again, we, I got it. I got all the ketchup we need, guys. <laughs> got all the mustard. You need some, some salt, you know, with that. But you see, we begin to see this picture a little better here. My cup runneth over. Again, it's that, it's that of a shepherd that has plenty of water to give to the sheep. It's that of a shepherd, hey, you don't need to go thirsty, sheep. You don't need because your cup is running over. You want some more? Hey, you finished that? I'm going to give you some more. There's that abundance that our good shepherd has. You know, it's interesting. The New Tr Living Translation states our text this way. My cup overflows with blessings. My cup overflows with blessing. Do you believe that this morning, Christian? As you live in this world, as you go day to day, you getting up, you know, getting up for work early tomorrow or for school, and oh, Monday, Monday, everybody, hey, tell me why I don't like Mondays. Always looking forward to Friday. Do you know that your cup overflows with blessings? You see, I fear that many of us have lived in spiritual poverty for so long within our lives that it's quite difficult for us to comprehend that the benefits of the Lord are deep, bountiful, and quite endless. He never runs out. And, and, and that's the thing that I think, again, because we came from a life of sin. Again, that's all of us before we were saved. We came from a life of sin, a life of spiritual depravity, 
And, and, and we were, you know, as we, we repented of our sins, believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior of our lives, and were born again of the Spirit of God, His Holy Spirit then sealing us for salvation for all eternity, He Himself then came to tabernacle within us, to dwell within the Christian for all time. And again, since we came from spiritual poverty before we were born again, so many of us, I, I, I believe firmly, still live there even today as Christians. Still live there mostly in spiritual poverty. There, there's even denominations today that teach basically that spiritual poverty is the way to be a Christian. There are no spiritual gifts anymore. The, the, the Holy Spirit doesn't really pour forth. They don't believe what the Bible says about being continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Thus they see the filling of the Holy Spirit as something scary, as something non-spiritual, when in fact it is quite the opposite. Now don't get me wrong, it's been hijacked by some other, in the, in the other extreme of the church. You know, we like to say they're swinging off the chandeliers. You know, and they do it in the name of the Holy Spirit. There's even songs about it. Oh, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Oh, fill the atmosphere. You know, fill me up, you know. And, and, and the song goes on to kind of talk about, you know, just, man, just fill me up so I can just experience you, basically. That's not why we're filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not so you can go, ooh, ooh, ooh. It's not. We're filled with the Holy Spirit so we can live after Jesus Christ. So we can go out and share the gospel with the world that is lost. It's not even just to be filled with the Spirit to speak in tongues. Go read Acts chapters 1, 2, and 3 and see and, and keep reading on. What did this whole filling of the Holy Spirit equal? You will receive the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit and then you will go forth and what? Be witnesses. You'll be a vibrant Christian. You're going to go to wherever you go and you'll be on fire for Jesus Christ. And when you read through the book of Acts, that's what we see exemplified. And that fire led many of them to death. There are so many Christians today, though, who live in spiritual poverty never really experiencing the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit of God in their lives in such a way that he is pouring out, overflowing, my cup overfloweth. You see, the Bible is very clear, guys and gals, that we are vessels, we're earthen vessels. I love it because sometimes I like to think of myself, no, you know, I'm more of a, you know, I'm a, more of a silver goblet kind of guy. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of cool looking, maybe a little wet. No, no, Bill, you are a, an earthen vessel made out of clay. You're weak, you're cheap, and it's not about you. You see, guys and gals, it's not about us. Because the reason we're called earthen vessels is it's, it's to explain to us, you know, it's almost like you are a brown paper bag. We think we're the gift inside. No, we're not. We're the brown paper bag. We're the wrapping paper. And again, I know some people go crazy on wrapping paper. My wife is, is one of those. <laughs> every Christmas present every, every, has to have a bow has to be not just a bow. I, when I say bow, it's like take off the little sticky thing and pop it on top. She's all, uh, 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 uh. That ain't happening in our house. So it takes them three weeks to wrap four presents. And we don't see her for most of those times. But I always tell her, honey, it's not about the wrapping. Thank you for your love in doing that. It's a blessing. But, I mean, it, guys especially, it's like this. <laughs> What's inside? Like, yeah, our girls will go, oh, Mom, look at this. This wrapping is so nice. Like, give me where's the knife. Cut it off. Get the ribbon. It's gone. It's what's, what's in the package? But that's how we need to be as Christians. It's not about us, the brown paper bags or the earthen vessels. It's about what's inside. And can I ask you to, today, what is inside of you? 
What's inside of us this morning? What, what, I, I love how one said it one time. It's like the best way to know what's inside of you, what you're filled with, is when you get bumped. You know like how when you have a cup or something and all of a sudden it gets bumped and something spills out? What happens when you get bumped? Somebody does something bad to you. Do you curse at them? Do you yell at them? Do you get angry? Or do you just, Lord, please bless that person. God bless you. And what comes out? And I'm telling you what, guys and gals, what a great way to know where you're at with the Lord. Who you're filled with or what you're filled with. You know, I've talked to Christians, you know, a lot of Christian couples and, you know, or even children, are, and it's like, oh yeah, I've heard my mom and dad, they're yelling at each other. Uh, you know, they've cussed at each other. They've this, it's like, what? What? What's going on there? And then they'll come to church, oh, praise you with my lips, Lord. Well, your lips are staying other stuff. During the, what are we filled with? Are we filled? You see, that's when we're filled with the things of this world. Or that's when we're filled with ourselves. Because again, when you look really deep at ourselves, it's a very ugly picture. It's a very ugly picture. But when we're filled with Jesus... And things bump us, and it's like, whoa, praise the Lord, man. And the, and the awesome part is when you do that, and you didn't even mean to. It's not like you purposely didn't get angry this time. It's like, boom, oh, and the Holy Spirit comes out, and it's like, wow, and it shocks you too. Wow, praise God, I didn't curse that time. And seriously, praise the Lord. And, and, and to be filled with the Spirit of God. You see, guys and gals, we, we studied this a, a couple weeks ago in John chapter 4. Let's turn there again. Well, again, it can't hurt to look at this again. John chapter 4, when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. We'll just look briefly at verses 13 and 14. And I'm going to read this this morning out of the New Living, just a little different, just to kind of give us a little breath of fresh air. John 14, starting in verse 13, just 13 and 14. It says, Jesus replied, people soon become thirsty again after drinking this water. Again, he's talking to the woman at the well and talking about well water. But the water I give them takes away thirst altogether. It becomes a perpetual spring within them, giving them eternal life. Now, what is he talking about? Well, he tells us in John chapter 7. Just go over a few chapters to your right. John chapter 7, starting in verse 37. John 7, 37. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now what is that rivers of living water? Well, verse 39. But he spoke this concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive. So again, beloved in Christ, does this describe you as a Christian? If, it's, if it doesn't, it should. If it doesn't, it should concern us that it doesn't describe us. It's not just, well, you know, it, it, that, that's just a spiritual thing. I, I'm okay. I'm good without that. No, you don't understand. You're not. I'm not. What are we filled with? Are we filled with the Holy Spirit? Notice, whom those believing in him would receive. Here's the point. As Christians, we should be the happiest, most satisfied, and peace-filled people on the entire planet. Are you? Are you the most satisfied, happiest, and peace-filled people on the planet? Why not? See, most Christians seem not to be. I mean, it's, seriously, it's a weird thing to me. It really, and I mean this sincerely, it's a weird thing when I meet people here at this church or outside the church, and they seem more like paupers in a, in a, in a, in a cruel world. They still seem hungry and thirsty and sad and not satisfied. And there's only one reason for this, and it's found in the book of Philippians. Turn with me, please, to Philippians chapter 3. 
We looked at this not too long ago as well. We're taking this in a slightly different direction. But Philippians chapter 3. Why are we still thirsty? Why is our cup not overflowing? And I believe this is the only reason for this. It's Philippians chapter 3 verses 7 and 8. That we're not doing this. This is Paul speaking in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. You see, so many who claim Christ have not counted things as loss or dung for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, to gain Christ. So many who profess Jesus, you know, that, that, that Jesus has saved them from this world, are still seeking satisfaction and happiness from the things of this world. Oh, if I only had a boyfriend, if I only had a girlfriend, then I would be happy. Guess what? That's not going to work. If you're miserable before you get into a relationship, guess what? You're going to be miserable when you get into the relationship. Because that boyfriend or girlfriend isn't meant to satisfy you. Oh, if I only graduate from this university or college. Oh, if I only get that raise. Oh, if I only won the lottery. I'd be happy for the rest of my life. You know, I, I'd go on one of those house hunter shows and, and buy a beach house and a mountain house and I'd just live the rest of my days just as happy as a lark. No, you won't. Because we're not meant to be happy and, and satisfied with the things of this world. God didn't make the world to say, okay, this is going to satisfy you. He made the world and said, only I can satisfy you. Only I am meant, you're meant to have fellowship with me. You're meant to bring me glory. You're meant to fellowship with me. And again, so they don't believe the spiritual truth that, they, that the things of this world are not here to give us satisfaction and to fill our deep spiritual needs. It is only the Christian in this world whose cup runneth over. Why? Why is that? Because we have the good shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord, to take care of us. He does take care of us, by the way, too. He doesn't, you know, we just need to simply be consumed with love for him. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when we're doing that, man, everything else in the world, everything becomes secondary. Because God doesn't sit up there and play hard to get. You know, I'm going to love, if I'm loving the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength as, as shown by his word. That's, that's what, what he shows us, by the way, through his word is how to do this. And by the way, how not to do this. And so as we're loving the Lord our God, everything else becomes superfluous. Everything else becomes secondary. Everything. And we realize our cup is running over. Because we have Jesus. You know, it's funny, I, I love to point out to some of my old surfer buddies that, you know, I, I like to ask them, what do you think heaven's going to be like? Dude, one long, gnarly killer wave. <laughs> just forever, just, woo, hanging ten, right? And then you go and you read about the new heavens and the new earth, and there's no seas, there's no oceans. <laughs> Bro, Bummer. But you see, it's not about those things. Other people, oh, it's going to be the perfect game of golf. By the way, there's no such thing. <laughs> if you play golf, you watch golf, it doesn't matter. You, you get perfect par in the whole course, you're not happy because you should have got under par. You get under par in the whole course, well, you should have got even further under par. I mean, seriously, it's one of those things. But again, that's, that's life in general. I mean, you go out and buy this killer new dress. Oh, it's beautiful. Or new shoes. Maybe that's your thing. Or a new person. You, you use it for a little while. It gets scuffed. You know, and again, sadly, like with a lot of the dresses, oh, I already wore that dress once. It's done. What? That ain't happened in our house. Eh? Three girls. Eight more. Oh. But here's the point. Jesus 
has saved us to the uttermost. Our black and vile and disgusting sins have been nailed to the cross, forever forgiven through his shed blood for the atonement of our sin. We should be going to hell for all eternity, but we are going to heaven instead because of what Jesus did for us. And, and, and that's not all. Jesus is now working in and through us for his good pleasure. He's preparing a place for us, a mansion for each one here who is his child, who has repented of their sins, been born again of the Spirit of God. Think about that, dude. What kind of countertops are going to be in there? I mean, think about it. He's preparing a place for you and me even now. We will be in heaven, the new heaven and the new earth with him for all eternity. No more weeping, no more sorrow, no more pain. Can I have an amen, anybody? I mean, think about this. He shall be our God. He will, you know, he will be our dwelling place. He will dwell amongst his people. He shall be our light. No need for the sun anymore. Forever and ever and ever. Now, if that doesn't get your juices flowing, you need to get saved. I'm not kidding. If, that, if you sit there and you're ready to yawn, oh boy, what time is it, man? You know, it's kind of breakfast time. I'm a little hungry. Something's wrong. I don't mind pointing that out because these are the kind of things that we should hear and just like, woo! And, and get us our cups overflowing again. Lord, you are so good. You know, because again, as God is working in our lives, he's overflowing us continually, or he, he is seeking to overflow us continually with his Holy Spirit to use us for his glory. Now, I do want to take a moment, though, to look at something else, the cup of suffering. Maybe there are some here this morning, maybe you've been there, maybe you're there, maybe you're going to be there, where your cup is overflowing with suffering as well. You know, in... in as one per person said, all who ever live will drink from the cup of suffering at one time or another. So we do need to understand that there is a cup of suffering. Jesus drank from this in Matthew 26, 39. It says, he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. We see this cup described in the psalm, Psalm 80, verse 5. You have fed them with the bread of tears and have given them tears to drink in full measures. Have you ever felt like that? You ever wept so much that you feel like that's all you're drinking, your tears? Psalm 102, 9. For I have eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping. You see, beloved in Christ, we, we need to understand that here upon this fallen world that, that the cup of suffering will come to each one of us, and most of us more than once throughout our lives. Some of us more, way more than others. I remember Talia and I sitting down with some good friends of ours down south, and they're pastoring a church as well, and when we told them some of the things that we'd gone through from deaths to other things, they're just like, man, you guys, you guys have gone through it. We, we, we don't have gone any, through anything like that. But then we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we understand that God allows us to go through these things uh, uh, to comfort others with which the comfort we've received from the Lord. And it turns it just a little bit. Perhaps some of you, though, have, have, have drunk from this cup of suffering. So funny. Drunk or drank? Drinking? Spellcheck told me drunk. So. so you've drunk from this cup of suffering, but you've stopped there. Maybe for some of you it's been many months, maybe it's others many years. Perhaps, you know, it's just been served to you and you're suffering in some form or another even now. Perhaps, again, it's years old and you can't seem to let go of that cup of suffering. Listen up, beloved, in Christ, for there is more to the description of the shepherd in this verse. Check it out once again, verse 5, the last part in Psalm 23. My cup runneth over. 
You see, another thing that the shepherd would do with this cup, <laughs> this is awesome, man, is when the sheep would be traveling back from the highlands, okay, as we talked about the, you know, the, the mesa, the table, that, and they'd be coming back at the end of summer, beginning of fall, and they'd be coming down because the weather would be cooling off. They'd be heading back home for the winter. And, and so as they were doing that, it was usually a beautiful time, cooling down time, a great time to be, and they were walking downhill usually, just a great time to be coming down. But every now and again, they would go through a storm. They would go through a bad storm that would, could bring uh, cold rain, snow, and hail. And they'd get stuck in the middle of this storm, a, you know, a, a wicked cold. You know, and the sheep, most of the time, a lot of them would be okay, but there were still usually the younger sheep or the older, weaker sheep or even some of the other ones who were just kind of sickly or whatever, but all, they didn't have their full fleece for some reason. And so, they, in other words, you know, all their wool wasn't in, and so they would get colder than others, and some would get just so despondent, the guy wrote, that they would just basically lay down to die. And so when the shepherd would see this, this particular shepherd, he would take that same cup out again, he'd put water in it, but he'd also mix some brandy in with the water. And he said he would give it to the sheep and the warmth inside that the alcohol gave them would always cause them almost immediately to jump up and start bouncing around. And what's awesome, if you think about that, once they started to move, this isn't a pro-alcohol thing right now, okay? <laughs> ah, I hear you guys. But once they started to move around, guess what? They started to warm up even more and more. And he said, he went on to say basically that he was sure, you know, that the shepherds 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago plus when this was written, that he's sure that they did the same sort of thing if they did that. Maybe mix some of their wine in and gave it to the, to the sheep. Now, why do we go there? Because this is going to trip you out. Turn to Matthew chapter 26, please. It's such a beautiful picture, guys and gals. And I pray that the Holy Spirit opens our eyes now to see this truly in our hearts. Matthew 26. So keep that description that we just gave, okay? What does our good shepherd do for us? Matthew 26, starting in verse 27. Matthew 26, 27. Then he took the, what? The cup. And gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. For the remission of sins. Turn with me please to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to read this out of the Amplified. Just awesome. 1 Corinthians 10.16 1 Corinthians 10.16 The cup of blessing of wine at the Lord's Supper, upon which we ask God's blessing, does it not mean that in drinking it we participate in and share a fellowship, a communion in the blood of Christ the Messiah? You see, guys and gals, for those who are currently drinking this cup of suffering, or if it comes, or you know, maybe you've been drinking it for a long time, fall into the perfect will of your good shepherd who loves you, who died for you, who rose for you, who lives for you. Take anew the cup of his shed blood for you. In other words, draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Remember that communion that we have, even this, you know, that cup that he, he did at the Last Supper, the cup that Paul mentions there, that's a representation of what God has done spiritually in our lives. Allow his spirit to flow through your veins and to get you to jump up in the middle of being worn out and tired and drinking of this cup of bitterness and shout for joy. Shout for joy in the midst of it. Take in the cup anew of his shed blood for you. Again, draw near to him. Allow his spirit through his shed blood to heal you, to comfort you, to infuse you afresh with his abounding spirit of life. 
Cast aside your fear. Give to him your hurt and your pain. Cast aside the lies of the enemies and, and hear the word of God. Ephesians 2.13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Be brought near once again to your good shepherd. Partake of him. The old hymn comes to mind, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns can pose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. The blood of Christ is powerful, beloved, in Christ. One person wrote this, they said, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. As he's, he's quoting from Revelation 12, 11, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. This person goes on to write, This is the last reference in the Bible to the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is the overcoming blood. Enable belie enabling believers to withstand the deceptions and accusations of Satan. There are at least 43 references to the blood of Christ in the New Testament, all testifying to its great importance in the salvation and daily life of the believer. Judas the betrayer spoke of it as innocent blood. Peter called it the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spots. In 1 John 1, 7, we read it as the cleansing blood, the washing blood in Revelation 1, 5, stressing that it removes our sins. You see, beloved in Christ, our God is a God that, as we've said before, he, we're not to live as paupers. Is your cup overflowing this morning? If not, draw near to the Lord anew. Take an infusion afresh of his Holy Spirit. Leave behind those things of this world. Pick up your cross. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow Christ afresh and anew. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, upon you and learn from, of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Does your cup runneth over this morning? If it doesn't, it's only one thing. It's our fault. But you know what's beautiful? It's, it's a place where we can come and rectify it in a moment's notice. Run to Jesus. Again, count everything in the world but as loss. Find comfort. By, remember, by the way, I'm, I've never said that that cup of bitterness or the cup of sorrow that we drink from isn't real. But let it be overcome by the blood of Christ. Let it be healed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And let your cup overflow it with Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, sometimes there's, there's nothing to say except praise you, God. Thank you, Lord, that you give us such large portions of yourself. Lord, I pray for each one of us here, Lord, those listening or watching, Lord, that, man, we would be those who are satisfied with you. Looking at our cup overflowing with you and your spirit, all the things you've done that you're doing and will do, God, they, they, they just blow us away, Lord. Father, I pray for each one here. I pray especially from those who are drinking of that cup of suffering, even now. Lord, may they run to you, Lord. May they rest in you, Lord. 
and may their cup overflow with, with a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit. May they believe your word above all else, Lord, the lies of the enemy, the real hurts of this world. May they believe your word. You'll never leave them nor forsake them, Lord, that you're working all things together for good to those who love you and those who are called according to your purpose, Lord. You're working all things for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand together.